Hello, thanks so much for your interest in DC statehood. This presentation will cover the basics. Please feel free to send any questions you may have to statehood at lwvdc.org. You will also find much more information on the DC statehood page of our website, lwvdc.org. Now let's quickly take a look at our table of contents. We will begin by covering some key moments in history, reviewing myths about statehood, and talking about why it matters to both DC residents and to the rest of the country. Then we'll provide some examples of the DC League's efforts to gain statehood and give you some suggestions for how you can support DC statehood. We think it's important to, both, to understand both how DC came to be and to explain some of the key turning points in our history. Again, if you find that you want to know more, please feel free to send your questions to statehood at lwvdc.org or explore our background papers found on our DC statehood page on our website. Please note that in 2024, we have never been closer to DC statehood. But let's start at the beginning. The Federal District, District of Columbia was established in 1790, and citizens were still allowed to vote in the states they used to live in. But in 1801, when, when Congress moved in and passed the Organic Act of 1801, from one day to the next, DC citizens were disenfranchised. The congressional record at the time shows that members were concerned about turning citizens into subjects, so it is not true that the Founding Fathers all wanted it this way. But they kicked the can down the road. Then in 1847, people on the Virginia side of DC voted to return to Virginia. Virginia voted to receive them, and Congress approved the retrocession, establishing the precedent that Congress could reduce the size of the federal district. In 1871, following the Civil War, Congress established a territorial government for D.C. in an attempt to allow the local government. But when they saw that black men were running for seats in the legislature, among other reasons, they abolished the territorial government and in 1874 established a governing commission of three presidentially appointed commissioners that lasted for a hundred years. It was not until 1964, with the passage of the 23rd Amendment to the Constitution, that citizens in D.C. were allowed to vote for president. Then, in 1973, limited home rule was established along with, a, along with allowing a non-voting delegate to Congress. Turbulent years followed, and in 2016, D.C. residents overwhelmingly voted to petition for statehood. Since then, H.R. 51 has passed the House twice and been introduced in the Senate with many co-sponsors, but has died with the end of the congressional session. This brings us to the present. There have been multiple attacks on D.C. home rule with local laws overturned. Many riders introduced that would interfere with the local decisions made by the mayor and D.C. council that have been elected by the people of D.C. There are even bills in both the House and Senate that call for the abolition of home rule. There are many misconceptions about D.C. statehood, some of them coming from honest misunderstanding and ignorance, and others stemming from deliberate misstatements and fear-mongering by opponents of D.C. statehood. Let's take a look at them. First, people often think that D.C. status is a local issue and does not necessarily affect them. However, D.C. is often used as a proving ground for unpopular measures that get enacted, that later get enacted nationally. For example, public charter of schools, and vouchers. The outcome of many issues taken up by Congress might be different if there were two senators and a representative from Washington Douglas Commonwealth who could vote. Opponents also often say that D.C. can't be a state because a federal district is called for in the Constitution. The Constitution, however, calls for a federal district no more than 10 square miles, but there is no minimum size. And Congress has already reduced the size of the district once. D.C. can become a state by an act of Congress signed by the president with no constitutional amendment needed. When the new state is admitted, the nation's capital will be in the smaller federal district. Our nation's capital will still belong to all Americans. Last, excuse me, third, as far as size is concerned, acres do not vote. People do. Washington, D.C. has more residents than either Vermont or Wyoming. Framers of the Constitution dealt with geographic size differences by making representation in the House by population and automatic two senators from every state. Opponents often suggest that D.C. can just go back to Maryland or Virginia. State boundaries, however, cannot be changed without the consent of the state. The Virginia side of D.C. already went back to Virginia before the Civil War, 
when Virginia voted to take it back, and Congress agreed. Maryland legislatures have voted overwhelmingly not to take D.C. back, and almost all the Maryland congressional delegations are co-sponsors of the Washington, D.C. Admission Act, a strong indication of Maryland's current sentiments. Lastly, opponents often accuse statehood advocates of a power grab. We are in a very polarized political atmosphere now. But the first D.C. statehood bill of the modern era was introduced by Fred Schwangel, a Republican from Indiana, and Ron Dellums, Democrat from California. While well, more than likely the first congressional delegation from the new state would be Democrat, there is no reason to think it will always be that way. Hawaii and Alaska were admitted together to balance party affiliations, and these two states have, sis- have since flipped. Why statehood? Let's take a quick look at why statehood is the remedy to the 223-year disenfranchisement of the some 700,000 people who live in D.C. First, D.C. elects a mayor and a D.C. council, but Congress can still throw out our laws, change our budget, regardless of how D.C. citizens feel about congressional mandates. If people in the 50 states disagree with their representatives and senators, they can vote them out of office. Without statehood, D.C. has no vote in Congress. Unlike all the states, the federal government runs D.C.'s judicial system, which is only one segment of D.C.'s governance not responsive to D.C. community culture and norms. As a state, D.C. would take back its its justice system and have the liberty to govern itself in many ways going forward. Lastly, without statehood, our license plates continue to speak the truth. This is taxation without representation, and we remain subjects of Congress. We think it is always helpful to be able to picture how things would work. This is the map showing the green, this map shows the green part, where about 700,000 people live, work, play, and pray. There are more than 125 named and recognized neighborhoods in this part of DC. They're filled with homes, schools, grocery stores, child care centers, parks, fire stations, urgent care clinics, universities, bus stops, and shopping centers. The smaller, lighter section is the federal district that will be called the Capitol and contains the Capitol building, the Supreme Court, congressional office buildings, White House, the Mall, and many monuments and museums. So why does achieving statehood even matter? We have discovered in our many years of working on this issue that it is really hard for Americans who live in the 50 states to understand what it is like to be voting rep- with to be without voting representation in our national legislature. Please take a moment to think about any issue you care about. Climate, gun safety, reproductive rights, education, housing, retirement, who sits on the Supreme Court, whether we go to war, anything. Even if you are not very active politically, you still have the right to vote for someone to represent you, that you can call to express your opinion. And if that representative does not represent you, well, you get to vote for someone else during the next election. If in D.C., for many, many years, we did not even have the right to vote for president, and now we have no one to represent us in the Senate and only a not-voting delegate in the House. We are forced to sit on the sidelines. Since 1801, the residents of the District of Columbia have no representation in Congress nor have they been able to govern themselves without interference from Congress. District residents are required to fulfill all the obligations of U.S. citizenship, paying taxes, voting, and serving on juries and in the military, but are denied a vote in our national government and sovereignty over state and local affairs? The people of the Washington, D.C. deserve the exact same rights that the people in the 50 states enjoy. America was founded on self-governance and no taxation without representation. Denial of the same to D.C. is downright un-American. So, in summary, why every American should care about D.C. statehood. First, think about the issues that you are that are most important to you. Voicing your opinions to senators and a voting representative makes a tangible difference. Stripping 700,000 individuals of their right to vote is a human rights violation. And how does that make us look on the global stage? Lastly, fairness and equality matter in a democracy. It's essential. 
So what has the LWVDC's efforts been to advance statehood? As our members have reached out to people who live in the 50 states, we have realized that folks often have a limited understanding of what it is like to live in D.C. We have heard that people are surprised to find houses and neighborhoods in D.C. Others thought that everyone in D.C. works for the federal government. They don't know that we pay taxes, that we lack representation, and they have trouble visualizing real people living in our hometown. Here are some ways that we have worked to make the fact that almost 700,000 real people live in D.C. feel real to the folks who live in the 50 states. We have asked people from all over the country to sign our petition, supporting D.C. statehood, and along with D.C. vote and ACLU D.C., we have delivered over 38,000 thousand petitions to Senate offices. We have sent postcards, put up yard signs, demonstrated in front of the White House, and written letters to the editor. We have held conferences envisioning statehood, reached out to our partners in collaboration on rallies and marched, and given our youngest the opportunity to express their views with hashtag picture 51. They make the art and we post it on social media. Our quilt challenge for DC statehood brought more than 60 poster-sized quilts to celebrate and advocate for full rights for DC citizens. There are just a few, these are just a few examples. And with DC Boat's coloring canvas, we have collaborated at many festivals and conferences, giving people a chance to add their own colors to our mural of DC. Now we move to what you can do to support DC statehood. Please understand that no matter where you live, you can take a part in this effort to expand and fix our democracy. If you live in DC, we bet you know people who live in the 50 states. And if you live in one of the 50 states, guess what? You have people in Congress who can vote to admit Washington Douglas Commonwealth as a state. Let's look at some ways to make a difference for the democracy. Here are a list of suggestions. This QR code takes you to our website where you can sign our petition. Ask your friends to sign it too. Talk to everyone you know about DC statehood. You'll find that people don't know much about it, so you can help them understand how important it is. You can also arrange for a briefing for your folks, so you don't need to figure out how to answer all the many questions people might have. We offer briefings on Zoom and in person, and are always happy to answer all the questions people may have. We can also provide you with a draft of the resolution supporting DC statehood for your organization to consider adopting. Organizations have adopted resolutions. It makes it much easier for them to show up later to support DC statehood. And finally, if you live in a state that has senators and congressmen who have a vote, they are the ones who must feel empowered to vote to admit the new state. So let them know how you feel about DC statehood. If you need more information, here's where you go to get it. We have our website listed below. We have the DC government's website. And again, for questions or to schedule a presentation with us, email statehood at lwvdc.org, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for your attention, and onward to D.C. statehood.